Good here, looking back. My name is John Howard. I'm the director of the National Institute for Occupational Safety and Health, and we have a, a really great webinar for you today. Uh, looking back, uh, we have some folks who were at the birth uh, of NIOSH uh, back in 1971, and we're going to hear from them, and we're going to hear from a number of folks who have spent uh, large portions of their career at, at NIOSH. Uh, and and we, we think this is an important way to start our 50th anniversary year by looking back at some of the foundational activities that led to uh, NIOSH in 1971. So I want to welcome you all. Uh, and I want to welcome especially uh, a newbie to NIOSH. I think she's only been here about uh, one decade. Uh, and that's Sarah Felkner, who's our Associate Director for Research Integration. And Sarah's going to be our moderator today and lead us through all of our fantastic speakers. So uh, for me, thank you for joining us today. And we hope that you'll join us for our other 50th anniversary webinars. So without further ado, I'm going to introduce Sarah. Thank you, Dr. Howard. It is my pleasure to serve as the moderator for today's presentations and panel discussions. And I want to thank our uh, thank and welcome our wonderful panel of speakers to help kick off the 50th anniversary of NIOSH with a look back at important at the important role of science in fulfilling the Occupational Safety and Health Act. Our agenda today will include opening remarks followed by presentations from each of our speakers, and these presentations will be followed by a panel discussion of pre-selected questions. We will not be able to take questions from the audience today. And first, a reminder of our disclaimer that the views expressed here today are those of the speakers and not necessarily the official position of NIOSH. And now it is my pleasure to introduce our speakers. Our first speaker today will be Donald Ellisberg. Mr. Ellisberg has spent the last 58 years working on various aspects of labor law and since 1981 has been representing a number of organizations on environmental, occupational health, training, worker disability and labor standards issues, as well as legislative and regulatory matters. From 1986 to 1991, he was the executive director of the Occupational Health Foundation, an organization assisting five departments of the AFL-CIO. And from 1990 to 92, he was the principal investigator and project director for the Center to Protect Workers' Rights, a nonprofit organization supported by the Buildings and Construction Trades Department of the AFL-CIO. During the Carter administration, he served as Assistant Secretary of Labor for Employment Standards, which covered enforcement and protective labor standards laws, such as minimum and prevailing wages, child labor and farm worker rights, equal employment and government contracts, and a number of worker disability and worker compensation programs administered by the federal government. For seven years prior to that, he was on the staff of the U.S. Senate Committee on Labor and Human Resources, including three years as the committee's general counsel and staff director. Mr. Ellisberg received his undergraduate degree in economics from the Illinois Institute of Technology and his law degree from the University of Chicago Law School. Our second speaker today will be Brian Harden. Dr. Harden is an occupational safety and health consultant with J.S. Held LLC. He worked at NIOSH from 1972 until his retirement in 2000 as the NIOSH Deputy Director. Dr. Harden received a Bachelor of Science degrees in Mathematics and Zoology and Master's degree in Zoology from the University of Oklahoma. He earned a Doctoral degree in Environmental Health Sciences from the University of Cincinnati. He served in the United States Army from 1966 to 68 and in the United States Public Health Service from 1972 to 2000, achieving the Public Health Service rank of Assistant Surgeon General. He's a fellow of the Academy of Toxicological Services, Sciences, and an associate member of the American College of Occupational and Environmental Medicine. Our third speaker today is Frank Pearl. Mr. Hurl is Chief of Staff at NIOSH, providing policy analysis, scientific and engineering support, and coordination related to emerging occupational safety and health issues. He's been with NIOSH since 1974. His past experiences include quality assurance, engineering, field industrial hygiene, epidemiology, and research management. 
He is co-author of numerous publications and presentations, mainly focused on the effects of dust on the lungs and cumulative risk. He has degrees in chemical engineering from Purdue University and the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. And our last speaker today will be Rosemary Sokas. Dr. Sokas is professor and former chair of the Department of Human Science in the School of Nursing and Health Studies and professor of family medicine in the School of Medicine at Georgetown University. She practiced primary care in rural Puerto Rico and in the Bronx and has held faculty positions at the University of Pennsylvania School of Medicine, the George Washington University School of Medicine and Health Sciences, and the University of Illinois at Chicago School of Public Health, where she directed the Division of Environmental and Occupational Health Sciences. She served as Associate Director for Science at NIOSH and directed the Office of Occupational Medicine for the Occupational Safety and Health Administration. Her research interests include participatory action research among high-risk, low-wage workers, intervention effectiveness evaluation, and occupational health disparities. She's a member of the Board of Directors for Farm Worker Justice and a member of the Technical Advisory Board for CPWR, the Center for Construction Research and Training. And now, before we get to our speakers, I'd like to invite Frank Hurl to provide some opening remarks. Frank? Thank you, Dr. Feltner. On December 29, 1970, President Richard Nixon signed the William Steiger Occupational Safety and Health Act of 1970 into law. It went into effect 128, 120 days later on April 28, 1971, and three agencies were created, the Occupational Safety and Health Administration, OSHA, the Occupational Safety and Health Review Commission, and the National Institute for Occupational Safety and Health, NIOSH. The purpose of the act was to assure as far as possible, every working man and woman in the nation safe and healthful working conditions and to preserve our human resources. On this, the 50th anniversary of the act and the establishment of these three agencies, we've brought together a distinguished panel of individuals to discuss the creation, the evolution and the development of NIOSH into the agency it has become today. I'm looking forward now to what my distinguished colleagues on this panel have to say and to explore and reflect on how our present was shaped by our history. Dr. Feltner. Thank you, Frank. And now it is my pleasure to invite Don Ellisberg to our virtual podium to provide some reflections on the early years of NIOSH. Don, welcome. welcome. Okay, here I am. Uh, thank you very much. It's an honor to be asked to uh, participate in this uh, very uh, uh, distinguished group. Um, I happen to be uh, probably invited because I consider that uh, I'm the uh, last man standing in terms of experience in uh, actually drafting the, uh, drafting the statute and going through the legislative process. Uh, my colleagues uh, literally have all either, almost all passed away or retired and that includes the members of the Senate and the members of Congress. So you'll have to take my views uh, as the, uh, uh, as, as quote truth, because I don't have anybody else to argue with. The uh, interesting thing about this whole experience of these agencies and, and, and particularly NIOSH, but it, it would be true of all of them is we, we put them together in a uh, relative time of peace and quiet uh, in the legislative process and with workers' rights. Um, I've read a couple of articles recently that said, well, you have to understand that OSHA really uh, wasn't a very strong statute, that uh, it was gutted ahead of time. Uh, and so forth and so on. Um, I have to take issue with it because as a statute, uh, I'm still convinced, uh, even including my own participation, uh, except, except that, that uh, this was a model statute for administrative law. 
the uh, administrative law provisions uh, came out of the uh, Administrative Procedure Act, and they were all of the things that have been screwed around with over the years were not included. Uh, this is a pure effort. Uh, the the uh, function of uh, everyone in uh, uh, putting this together was uh, the I guess the perimeter or the pr primary push had come from the uh, coal mine health and safety and the uh, uh, explosion that had uh, uh, decimated a uh, number of workers there. And there was a, a real uh, view that we needed to do something different. Uh, I'll also say that in putting this together, an awful lot of the dialogue, which really uh, reflects on NIOSH, and their mission was that this was going to be a statute that primarily was engaged in the health issues, occupational health issues of the workers. Uh, it's, of course, tons and tons of uh, uh, decisions and lots of uh, uh, books, green books, of cases from the uh, Review Commission uh, and the courts and so on and so forth that didn't have to do with that. But I think the real focus was the, uh, the health issues of the workers. Uh, the uh, responsible person for uh, NIOSH uh, I would have to say the main push, uh, maybe the only push came from Senator Jacob Javits, who was the ranking minority member of the Labor uh, Public Welfare Committee at the time. Uh, he and his staff uh, were very much uh, into how do you put a, this NIOSH together. I'll also have to say that in terms of controversy, uh, I have I have very little recollection of controversy over NIOSH. We basically it was put together by uh, eight or ten of us uh, sitting around having lunch at one of the restaurants on the Senate side. Uh, very little was changed. The uh, emphasis uh, the emphasis was going to be uh, uh, that NIOSH was going to be the the decision maker on what the real health issues were for workers. And then the, the, uh, uh, they were going to send something over. Uh, now it was a criteria document. I have no idea what it is now. And that uh, laid out what this, uh, these issues were and what, what the framework of a regulation should be. And then they, frankly, the statute left it up to the Secretary of Labor to decide uh, what was, uh, quote, feasible. Uh, they didn't decide whether it was uh, uh, mecha uh, mechanically feasible or uh, uh, scientifically feasible uh, because neither side could get the votes. Uh, the labor side wanted, obviously, the uh, uh, scientifically feasible and the uh, management side really wanted it feasible only if they could do it. So that little little matter is one of the very unstated comment uh, goals of the statute. And frankly, we knew at the time it was going to the Supreme Court and it did. And it came out more or less the way we thought it would uh, but with, with, with primarily the science, um, but that was uh, that was then, and and that was a time, as I say, when people uh, were were coordinating. This this committee that worked to put NIOSH together and OSHA together was uh, uh, a guy, a couple of people. One guy actually from the AFL from the uh, Chamber of Commerce, I think somebody else from, um, no, that was it. And, and then there was uh, the uh, Labor, Secretary of Labor's office, and, and, and Jim Hodgson was the, the uh, push behind it. And then there was uh, the labor people, 
who uh, were uh, uh, split over uh, a bunch of people, uh, Howard McGuigan and uh, uh, I'm trying to remember who else, but there were six or eight who were principal people involved. So when you had to have a, a discussion of what to do, you had maybe five or six people sitting around the table uh, and making a judgment. Now, that was very typical of, of uh, that kind of legislation in the 50s, uh, in 60s and 70s. If you were to replicate or try to replicate that kind of a concept, uh, our, my estimate is you'd probably have to have a uh, small committee of about 50 people who could deal with this because everybody now has an interest. Uh, in those days, uh, the interest came through the chamber or the uh, NAM and that was it. So uh, I, I'm only, uh, I'm just trying to give you a flavor of where we were. Uh, but as a, as a result of uh, how you, um, how you, how you played with this at, at, at the outset, uh, NIOSH had a, uh, had a very strong charter. Uh, and there, are, I think, were two, about eight or nine uh, directors of NIOSH. Each one uh, played a very significant role. Each one had a, a piece of the action, but uh, they were professional people who did what they needed to do, even if we didn't always disagree agree with them. Um, I, uh, I had a, I was trying to say, what else would you say about it? Uh, you heard my experience with uh, Occupation Health Foundation, second and center for uh, workers' rights, whatever they call it now. Uh, uh, and that was an effort to uh, uh, make the make sure that the agencies had a had a uh, heard, heard from somebody about what they thought. Uh, I think I, I need to uh, I need to stop at that point because I think I've given you this flavor of a quiet Congress. Uh, and I, uh, and whatever they were fighting about, this was not it at the time. The bill passed the Senate 83 to three or something like that, and went to the House and passed. Uh, and uh, uh, I guess I think that's where I should stop, other than telling you that my personal experience with NIOSH, other than running the Senate, was that uh, uh, my daughter was born uh, in uh, July 1st of 1970 while we were in the middle of working on the statute. Uh, so she is now also 51 years old and has had a outstanding career in uh, public service and dealing with the same kinds of issues that uh, NIOSH deals with and uh, uh, the poor and, and, and those who are less fortunate. Uh, I think uh, I like to think that some of the NIOSH stuff rubbed off on her. Thank you. John, thank you very much for that interesting historical perspective on the origins of NIOSH. And now I'd like to invite Dr. Pardon to our virtual podium to discuss some NIOSH achievements over the years. Brian? If I can get my camera on, yes. Uh -huh. Thank you. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be invited to participate. Um, I'm going to try to encapsulate my 28 years at NIOSH uh, in, in the 10 or 12 minutes here with some high points of events that happened over those years at the various places I served. The next slide I think will show what the trajectory of my career was over those 28 years. I, I started in, in the Rockville Maryland office, main office of NIOSH, doing criteria documents, and then went to Cincinnati 
to do uh, experimental toxicology and then some more back to the standards development group still in Cincinnati. Uh, in the mid 90s, I went to Washington DC as a, uh, the NIOSH eyes and ears, if you will, of NIOSH, the NIOSH director there because the, the director was in uh, Atlanta by then. And then at the end of my career, I was deputy director in Atlanta. Starting in 1972, when I got there, <clears throat> Criteria documents were, my NIOSH thought, and, and many of us thought were maybe the most important thing NIOSH had to do because the environmental or the occupational safety and health community was, was anxious. They were urgently looking for comprehensive safety and health standards for the workplace uh, to replace the startup standards that consisted of just a, uh, an exposure limit ad adopted from HGIH TLVs, but they wanted a comprehensive standard which was the, the exposure limit along with recommendations for medical monitoring, uh, worker training, safety and health education, uh, sampling and analytical methods, worker protective clothing and equipment, respiratory protective devices and so forth. So that was the, always the first chapter of a criteria document. And then the cr criteria, the, uh, the scientific basis that supported that was the rest of the document. That's made a criteria document. Uh, we had perhaps a naive expectation in that we thought that after we uh, produced these wonderful comprehensive documents that the uh, regulatory agency would take them and publish the first chapter, the recommended standard in the federal register and go straight into notice and comment rulemaking. Uh, that has never happened. And in fact, uh, the regulatory agencies have acted on few criteria documents, although they do eventually have gotten around to most of them. My next stop after that was uh, going to the Division of Biomedical and Behavioral Sciences. I think, I'm not sure what its name is now, maybe different. Uh, I went to the Experimental Toxicology Branch there in Cincinnati. There was also a toxicology branch in the Division of Respiratory Disease Studies in Morgantown. We had to be careful not to step on each other's toes and to keep our programs uh, separate, not duplicative. duplicative. But uh, in about 1975 or six was when uh, an hematocyte, dibromochloropropane, was identified as causing infertility in male agricultural workers. So uh, suddenly uh, mutagenesis, fertility impairment, and developmental toxicity were hot items. And, and that's what really got my interest as I went into the toxicology branch. So I think a, a major success story for NIOSH from this time period was what we did with ethylene glycol ethers. Our practice then was to look forward four years, five years to what would be, what were scheduled criteria documents, identify what the information gaps were that would hinder uh, document development and try to get some toxicology work done in advance to head off those gaps. Glycol ethers, ethylene glycol ethers were scheduled for standards development. And so we, we set out to do some studies in, in my case, it was involving uh, reproductive and developmental toxicology. And we discovered that when pregnant rats or rats, rabbits or rats were exposed to glycol, ethylene glycol ethers at the existing PEL, uh, they had their offspring had major birth defects and a high proportion of dead fetuses. Higher concentrations killed all the fetuses in the pregnant animals. Uh, that research was gathered up and published for the first time in 1981. And that triggered quite an expansion in glycol ether research, both in NIOSH and the federal government, EPA and elsewhere, and in private business chemical companies. Uh, NIOSH responded with a current intelligence bulletin and two criteria documents. NIOSH collaborated with our our counterparts in Sweden and the French, uh, yeah, the Swe the, the I'm not, the uh, Nordic countries and produced a Nordic criteria document for propylene glycol ethers. NIOSH sponsored a, a international symposium on glycol ethers in Cincinnati in 1983, and then later collaborated in 1993 with our colleagues from, from France and Sweden to sponsor a follow-up criteria uh, international, international conference in uh, Nancy, France. Uh, OSHA responded to this 
ultimately in 1993 by proposing new standards for several ethylene glycol ethers. They even went so far as to hold rulemaking hearings in 1994, but that proposed rulemaking was, was withdrawn in 2003 on the grounds that glycol ethers were so rarely used and were so heavily controlled by then that there was no point in going forward with a new standard. So I'm going to count that as a success story for NIOSH uh, research, uh, even though I wish they would have gone ahead and changed the standards. So those original standards are still in the books, on the books for glycol ethers. What was uh, really going on though, on the next slide, in 1986, uh, I went over to the Division of Standards Development and Technology Transfer. By now, the criteria document business was, it was centered in Cincinnati and it was much less important than, the, uh, than it had been previously. Uh, it was, in fact, it was during my tenure as chief of the document development branch that NIOSH failed for the first time to send at least one criteria document in a fiscal year to OSHA and it was expected that the sky would fall, but to demonstrate, I guess, that the criteria documents were not as important as they had been, uh, the sky didn't fall. Though what was happening in 1986, that was hot news and really consuming everyone's attention was the HIV AIDS epidemic. Uh, that was exploding across the country. It had people in a terrible state of fear and, misunderstanding, the Congress directed NIOSH to develop recommended standards to protect uh, healthcare workers and others with who might be exposed from infection with HIV. Uh, this was uh, the first time that NIOSH had been uh, invited to, to go into off-limits territory, that of infectious disease. The development of the guidelines required a, a great deal of work on a very short time frame, but since I was the chief of the document development branch, it landed on my desk and we had to go, th there were so many people and groups at that time who were agitating, uh, campaigning for various issues relating to HIV that we had to be sure we consulted with and got comments from all of those public, private and professional organizations and then coordinated up through CDC and the Department of Labor, Department of Health and Human Services. but. The guidelines were finally published in October of 1987 as the Joint Advisory Notice. It was named that because it was jointly sponsored and signed by the Secretary of Labor and the Secretary of Health and Human Services. Uh, so it, it, it went out in 1987 uh, and in 1992, a mere five years later, OSHA had a bloodborne pathogen standards on the book, which books, which was drawn directly from that Joint Advisory Notice. and. I think it's, uh, it's one of the strongest examples to point to where the NIOSH effort directly contributed to the OSHA rulemaking. After that, in 1992 is when I went to, to Washington, that was quite an intense time. NIOSH and OSHA were, were anxious to improve their public images by being seen to cooperate and collaborate with each other. So I spent some time work as a, assigned to the Assistant Secretary for Labor for OSHA uh, as, a, as a special assistant. But in 1994, the new Congress came in. Uh, there was quite a sea change in Congress in, in the midterms in 1994. And they came into office vowing to eliminate two federal agencies, NIOSH and the Bureau of Mines. They succeeded with the Bureau of Mines, but thankfully they failed to kill off NIOSH. But it was a near-death experience for us. And, and it was part of the stimulus to develop the National Occupational Research Agenda, which continues today to be uh, the way that NIOSH can stimulate collaboration with the outside and, and involve outside partners in our research program. So at the end, not only did NIOSH survive, but it emerged stronger and more diverse because even though the Bureau of Mines was eliminated, Two of the research laboratories from the Bureau were preserved and transferred to NIOSH, that being the Pittsburgh Research Facility and the Spokane, Washington Research Labs. We had a big success in 1995 when respirator certification standard was updated. It had been it, the existing certification standard that NIOSH inherited in 1971. 
had come from the Bureau of Nines, Mines and originated in the 1930s. The new one uh, promulgated uh, much needed improvements in the testing and certification program and introduced the new NR and P series of, of uh, filters. We had a stumble in 1995 when another infectious disease, multi-drug resistant TB was uh, raging and, and infecting healthcare workers, police officers, uh, corrections officers, and so forth. Uh, NIOSH recommended that all of those folks be provided with, rec with powered air purifying respirators. Uh, the backlash from all of those uh, communities and others was, uh, was very intense. It was sharp, fast, intense, and, and it, nothing ever happened, nothing ever came from it. And it seems especially ironic to me now to see the extent to which everybody in the uh, hospital ERs and uh, uh, intensive care units caring for coronavirus, everybody seems to be wearing uh, PAPR these days. And that, the best I can tell, that happened without any kind of comment or conflict. They're just doing it. So having do dodged the bullet in 92, from 96 to 2000, I, was, I bounced between Washington and Atlanta. The issues, in many ways, were the same. They, you know, as the more things change, the more they stay the same. What goes around comes back around to get you again. MDRTB, uh, I don't know if it's ever been as hot as it was in the, uh, in the earlier period, but, but it's still there. Legionnaire's disease is still there. Uh, there were times in these uh, 96 to 2000 when NIOSH HHE people and OSHA inspectors and Center for Infectious Disease uh, teams were on the same site investigating the same Legionnaire's disease outbreak. And that led to some difficult moments. Health effects of indoor mold, indoor air quality, those were, those were hot button issues going all the way back into the mid eighties that w when I was aware of them being hot issues and they're still hot issues today. So uh, not to minimize anything, but I think the, the key is even though we don't get where we wanted to be, as quickly as we wanted to. If we've done the good science, we've put it out there uh, in a sensible way, I think the good work will show through. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Brian, for that review of some important NIOSH accomplishments over the years. And now Frank Hurl will join us to discuss the important role of science in fulfilling the Occupational Safety and Health Act. Frank? Oh, thank you, Sarah. Uh, so let me begin by looking back, and uh, as uh, Sarah said, I'm going to take a, a look through the important role of science uh, that uh, NIOSH had in fulfilling the Occupational Safety and Health Act. Next. So the, the approach that I'm going to take is actually going to be kind of a, a timeline. It starts in the past uh, with the uh, fact that NIOSH built infrastructure. Uh, we're going to go and talk a little bit about preventing recognized hazards and then recognizing new hazards, and then anticipating technological change and looking into the future. Next. So we'll start with building infrastructure. Oops, I think it went one by. So my, my history with NIOSH started in 1974 when I was a chemical engineering graduate and I was hired by NIOSH to uh, examine gas detector tubes. And that picture in the upper right is yours truly. Uh, with the apparatus that I used to create controlled test atmospheres to run the gas detector tubes against to see whether they were calibrated well, the amount of variability involved, and so forth. The gas detector tube certification program required that a detector tube be plus or minus 35% accuracy at one half the Pell and plus or minus 25% accuracy at one, two, and five times the Pell. So my little gas blending units generated those concentrations and we tested it. Now, before the program was established in around 1973, 74, um, I think I was the second person to actually run the, the, the program. Uh, detector tubes were being tested by NIOSH and were found to be maybe at best plus or minus 100%. And the only recommendation that NIOSH could have to the industrial hygiene community was you need to calibrate the tubes before you use them. But by 1981, after running the gas detector, tube, gas detector tube program for six or seven years, 
the quality of the detector tubes improved across all of the manufacturers that were making them. And by 1981, it was decided that the NIOSH certification program was no longer needed, that the tubes were all performing much better. In this case, NIOSH, without really forcing anyone to do so, improved the quality of the ability for industrial hygienists to make spot um, uh, measurements of different gas concentrations. Next. So additionally, in, along the area of building infrastructure, I wanted to point out four main things that I think that NIOSH did, especially this was in the early days. Um, one was uh, through the standards completion program that NIOSH operated, they put together the NIOSH Manual of Analytical Methods. And it's gone through a number of editions, but I can tell you that these methods are used worldwide now. And the standardization, the validation that the methods went through improved reliability and reduced variability uh, for uh, envir making environmental measurements and environmental chemistry. Additionally, NIOSH set up a program called the Proficiency Analytical Testing or PAT program. Now the PAT program assured quality assurance by providing spiked samples to laboratories that were doing industrial hygiene chemistry and provided their res response to them. This was a very po popular program. And in fact, uh, at, uh, this program is presently operated by the American Industrial Hygiene Association in its lab accreditation program. Um, and then I just highlighted just two because there, there are probably so many, but I can think of the methods development group that developed the elemental and total carbon methods actually resulted and provided the basis for the diesel emission standards that MSHA ultimately promulgated. And other methods development uh, were done by both laboratories in Cincinnati and also uh, some of our other field operations for real-time detection on surface contamination. These have resulted in licensed products that are actually sold to measure surface contamination of lead, illegal drugs, and chemotherapy drugs. Next. Another technology uh, uh, infrastructure development, as I would call it, was measurement technology for uh, respirable dust. Um, the NIOSH developed with partnership with uh, manufacturers of equipment, uh, continuous personal dust monitor, which have been actually adopted into MSHA's coal mine dust regulations. This moved us from the situation where in the lower left corner of the slide shows um, the sampling devices that were used for aspirable and total dust in the past involved pre-weighing a filter, going and making the measurement, sending the filter cassette to the laboratory and then getting the results some days later, as opposed to the development that, that NIOSH produced where a miner can actually look down at the device on his belt and get an immediate readout on what the dust concentration is instantly, and also over the course of a shift, data that can be transmitted electronically back to MSHA as part of the enforcement program, or to the company so that they can use it to control their own workplace. Next. So moving on from infrastructure development, I want to talk about a couple examples of controlling recognized hazards. There were a number of hazards that were recognized for quite a long time. The National Study of Coal Workers Pneumoconiosis Actually, I think it may have begun even before NIOSH started. It ran four rounds of uh, studies uh, doing x-rays, pulmonary function testing on coal miners. At the same time, exposure assessments were being done in partnership with MESA or later and later MSHA. Um, the analysis, the risk assessment, the surveillance of health conditions in miners all together led finally to the adoption of the new coal mine dust standard, which was adopted in 2014. This is a case where from 1970 to the ultimate impact in 2014 shows that you have to have a little bit of persistence with uh, occupational limits. Next. Another example of needing uh, some persistence regards silicosis and the prevention of silicosis. Silicosis studies actually began in the 1920s with public health service studies of the dusty trades, continued on through the 30s, 40s, 50s, and 60s, and NIOSH continued to do uh, studies of exposures to crystalline silica. 
We continue to do disease surveillance. Our chemists in Cincinnati developed additional techniques for X-ray diffraction in partnership with MSHA infrared analysis and, and respirable dust monitoring. We also work to do control technologies and identify places where exposures were happening uh, that may not have been recognized that there was a silica exposure and put out a number of alerts. And we also had a national program combined with MSHA and with OSHA uh, with the catchphrase, it's not just dust, to try to make impact with the community of workers and employers to reduce exposure limits before regulation. Well, ultimately, all of this led to the adoption of the crystalline silica standard set by OSHA on March 25th, 2016. So another success that of uh, a body of work uh, compiled by NIOSH that led to federal regulation. Next. Another area of, uh, of concern is in the safety world had to do with tractor rollovers. Uh, in partnership with the uh, NIOSH funded agricultural research centers, uh, NIOSH identified tractor rollovers as a significant cause of fatalities and injuries. We established a uh, fatality assessment and control evaluation or FACE program to investigate causes of death in a variety of different industries, but they also looked at this tractor rollover problem and led to the development of ROPS. Uh, NIOSH specifically was involved in the design of a cost-effective rollover protective structure called CROPS and an automatically deploying rollover protective structure, AutoROPS. Uh, NIOSH concluded that over 70% of the deaths that had been occurring from tractor rollovers could have been prevented if ROPS were used. And it led to subsequently uh, seven states having a rebate program to install ROPS onto uh, existing stock of tractors. And today they're very commonly applied on, on, on new tractors being sold. Next. <clears throat> Another partnership that led to some success was the Asphalt Pavers Partnership. Uh, in this case, uh, federal government, state highway departments, labor unions, trade associations, and equipment manufacturers got together and recognized that while we could continue to argue about the uh, health effects of asphalt fume, it might be possible just to simply get out and control them. And so this project led to a control technology for asphalt paver devices that was rolled out and over a 10 year period applied to, very, to asphalt pavers across the US. Uh, Don Ellisberg was a, a significant player in this particular asphalt pavers partnership. Next. Recognizing hazards, next. One of the things that came up from the NIOSH Health Hazard Evaluation Program uh, was a recognition that there was a lung, serious lung disorder that was occurring with exposure to nylon flock. I think it was an interstitial lung disease that was really rather perplexing because it should not have been caused because the particles were uh, small particles of um, this nylon tow, uh, which is a, a rope of nylon that were, the particles were like about a millimeter in diameter. And then they would be guillotined into smaller particles and then through an electrostatic deposition form the nice felt, felt, uh, felt uh, lining that you find inside of jewelry boxes and on crushed velour seats and uh, in cars it was all done with nylon flock. But why was it happening with an, in deep in the lung where only small particles could have survived? Laboratory studies by NIOSH on the left side led us to realize that there were some small particles appearing in the lung and they were very oddly shaped. We couldn't quite figure it out. When we took an electron microscope view of particles from air samples, again, there were those same particles. A close-up view of the uh, nylon toe that was being guillotined to form the small flock particles showed that when the blades on the guillotine were becoming dull, they were extruding out these small pieces where the red arrow is pointing. And strangely enough, they looked just like the particles we were seeing in the lungs and in the air. We were able to give feedback to the industry to be able to reduce the uh, amount of, of, of particles that were being formed and help control uh, to reduce the disease. Next. Another area of concern that showed up was uh, it was reported to us that there were a group of workers working in microwave popcorn industry that were developing a severe lung disease called obliterative bronchiolitis. 
our industrial hygienists visited the, the facilities. We looked at it from the distribution of where the diseased workers were in the plant and discovered there was an association between where the workers worked and exposure to diacetyl, which chemically is known as 2,3-butanedione and is the chemical structure that you see below. Uh, once having identified that, industry actually responded and went through and did a substitution, click, and substituted uh, an extra methyl group onto the uh, butanedione and formed 2,3-pentanedione, which still produced the same buttery flavor, uh, also still had some toxicity, which NIOSH found through work we did with the National Toxicology Program. So this resulted in ultimately putting out a criteria document uh, for 2,3-butanedione uh, and 2,3-pentanedione with recommended exposure limits. Next. Final thing I wanna talk about is anticipating hazards and opportunities. Next. Um, one of the areas that we recognized about 10 years ago that was a significant uh, area of growth in the US economy was that of using nanomaterials. NIOSH brought to bear um, expertise in laboratory science to look at the pulmonary effects of exposure to various uh, types of nanomaterials, including carbon nanotubes, and I've described the effects on this slide for those. We conducted exposure assessments in laboratories and manufacturing facilities that were using nanotubes. And with the information we gathered, we were able to come up with a design and a plan for workplace design solutions so that workers could be protected while they implement what could be a very potentially useful technology in using nanomaterials. Next. And the final thing I wanna say is we've looked to the future and we've seen that the future of work probably holds something to do with robotics and artificial intelligence. And in 2017, NIOSH formed the Center for Occupational Robotics Research, which has now begun uh, doing investigations, in laboratories. We also funded robotics researchers through grants with the through the National Science Foundation. So we have academic researchers working on these issues as well doing research on how robots can be used to minimize or eliminate human health risks, such as perhaps confined space entry or move going, working in uh, very hazardous environments, um, heat and radiation and so forth. Uh, and research also then to assure that as we work closer in the environment with robots, that they don't introduce new, new risks to the workers uh, in the workplace. Next. So I think in conclusion, I wanna say that, you know, NIOSH has worked to build infrastructure. We work to identify hazards. We work to find solutions to hazards once they're identified. And as part of the Occupational Safety and Health Act gave us responsibility to look for new technologies and new exposures that are introduced in the workplace. We've been trying to work to meet those requirements as well. Thank you. Thank you, Frank, for that discussion of the important science conducted at NIOSH in fulfilling the Occupational Safety and Health Act. Our final speaker today will be Rosemary Sokas, who will give us a snapshot of NIOSH from 1999 through 2002. Rosie? Thank you so much, Sarah. And I wanna say how grateful I am to be part of this panel, but even more to be able to connect again with my good friends at NIOSH and to thank you each of you for the work that you've done over this pandemic period as we enter a new phase where worker safety and health has become again a new and importantly recognized issue. Next slide please. So first of all I'm grateful, so grateful for having had the opportunity to work with such wonderful senior scientists. These are the people I worked with the most closely and they are universally an amazing group of people. I wanted to particularly honor the late Lynn Jenkins who single-handedly essentially founded the um, study of workplace violence at NIOSH and, and helped frame that whole issue, tragically lost at a young age. 
Um, Roger Rosa, who was a longstanding senior scientist, also really is credited for having established the field of fatigue and sleep studies as they relate to work and workers. Um, and for those of you who've had the great good fortune to work with Chris Softy or Naomi Swanson, you have had the privilege of working with people who are incredibly smart scientists and kind individuals at the same time. And really the last thing I'll say is that my two accomplishments while I was at NIOSH were to recruit Matt Gillen away from EPA and Anita Schill away from OSHA. So you're welcome. Next slide, please. The turn of the millennium as now, NIOSH was brimming with talent and people who cared and really were able to cross disciplines, work together and accomplish amazing things because of their passion for the mission of the organization. There were large scale studies, some of which started from health hazard evaluations that managed to loop in the toxicologists as well as the engineers to try to develop the prevention pieces that you've heard about. At, at that time, we had kind of gotten away from an earlier era where OSHA actually would sometimes get these big negotiated settlements with industry and say to industry, listen, you guys need to go to NIOSH and figure out what this problem is, give them access and maybe a little funding while you're at it. Um, and the other thing that OSHA did way back in the past was to occasionally provide funding to NIOSH to go across the country to search, to, to do an actual hazard assessment that they could then subsequently make use of when they were setting their regulatory agenda. So this had all kind of wound down by the time of the turn of the millennium. And so we started really focusing, as you've heard from Brian in particular, and from Don on finding resources, leveraging resources uh, with through the NORA uh, effort, through federal partners, uh, trying to uh, get little pieces of occupational safety and health worked into some of the NIH requests for proposals. Next slide, please. And this is really just a tiny fraction of the type of work that NIOSH engages in, and in particular were important areas of research back 20 years ago that were of, um, of major significance uh, across workplace uh, safety and health. I wanted to uh, highlight a couple of the health hazard evaluations that stood out in my mind. Jane McCannon was the person who figured out that in fact, carbon monoxide exposure outdoors off the back of these houseboats and uh, uh, these cigarette boats was sufficient to cause people to die from carbon monoxide poisoning. She worked with engineers from Cincinnati to figure out fixes for this. She worked with policy people to try to get the Coast Guard to change its regulations. And so there was a lot of work done there. I want to give a shout out to Yvonne Boudreau, who back when all of this TV stuff is happening, also figured out that outdoor workers in a in the stericycle hazardous waste facility who were processing hospital waste were getting infected with tuberculosis. And then really these are face program uh, investigations, but cell tower construction and repair, um, firefighters, there were a number of areas in which the face program again, led the way in terms of um, uh, identifying areas of need and importance for change. Um, let's go to the next slide, please. And I just wanted to pick up on one of the examples that uh, Frank just told you about the technical assistance that the state of Missouri asked for with the popcorn lung. You started out with pretty much a classic HHE type of approach relatively quickly. Then you had NIOSH scientists really engaging in a full scale study that wound up being, I believe it was the lead article in the New England Journal of Medicine issue uh, for that issue. And then simultaneously, you had the toxicologists in hell 
held working on the um, trying to figure out which of the components were really at uh, fault and looking at the toxic mechanisms using rodent models. So um, this kind of real time collaborative activity that managed to produce enormous uh, pieces of information, again, because of the unique capabilities that NIOSH has with the different disciplines that are able to collaborate and work together. Next, please. And as Brian told you so vividly, um, the blowback against NIOSH getting involved with infectious diseases had come from within CDC as well as outside of CDC, but the healthcare workforce remained uh, an issue. And so there was a decision made to really focus on this as an industry. And the one of the things that resulted from that is this is the first industry focus that really has a majority female workforce. So that was a, a, a kind of a conscious decision that NIOSH made in the face of considerable opposition with all of the different issues that you can see being related not only to worker safety, but to patient safety and trying to engage in the nexus of that. AHRQ collaborate, the Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality, which also, in addition to uh, the Bureau of Mines and NIOSH, had been slated for elimination with the new Congress. So they actually had a nice collaborative relationship with us, um, said that we'll happily co-sponsor a meeting in Pittsburgh that would address the nexus between worker safety and patient safety. The um, keynote speaker at that meeting was the late Paul O'Neill, who at that time was was the CEO of Alcoa had been very engaged with worker safety and health and as a philanthropist had also become engaged with patient safety and saw the connections quite vividly. In a response to a question, this isn't even part of his talk, he said along the lines of, you know you're working for a high performing organization when you can ask and answer affirmatively three questions each day. Am I treated with respect? Am I able to make a contribution? Am I recognized for that contribution? He also said that safety is not a priority, it's a prerequisite. Next slide, please. At the same time, we as NIOSH were kind of looking at different workforce characteristics. Young workers were uh, being killed disproportionately, uh, as was uh, evident from some of these heartbreaking face reports. EID did a great job pulling together outreach and training materials to focus on that population. The aging workers were also a, uh, an issue with um, uh, NIOSH being an early recognition of that. I think the Newsweek cover uh, might have gotten scrubbed off, but they had the, um, uh, the oh, there you go, thank you. The uh, recognition of the aging workforce as an issue was, became fairly widespread but NIOSH was early on with it and uh, commissioned a National Academies report that set a lot of important uh, baseline information uh, that pointed towards organization of work issue and ergonomic issues. It also sponsored conferences and really kind of led the way into that. Next slide, please. And of course, occupational health disparities. Now, interestingly, earlier, the ethnicity question on federal um, uh, data gathering was not there. So you wound up in occupational settings with Latinos basically kind of self-selecting their race and their options weren't many. So they would often self-select as white, um, which kind of obscured some of the injury differences between uh, white workers and African-American workers, as you might imagine. At that time, Bob Park also figured out that among African-American workers, you had this kind of super healthy um, a worker phenomenon because you had the African-American worker population being compared to the African-American population as a whole with a higher unemployment rate and other illnesses associated with that. So really, um, a lot of this was kind of coming to the fore. Uh, Melody Kawamoto and uh, Sherry Barron and others were looking into the increased rate of fatal traumatic injuries among Latino workers. And at the time in the 90s, really, 
the entirety of the increase in the uh, workforce was comprised of immigrant workers. So again, NIOSH got very active in this space, um, began to study these demographic differences, provided congressional testimony to a hearing that the late Paul Wellstone had in his subcommittee. Um, and, uh, and again, it became a focus that continues to this day in NIOSH work. There was a national Acad another National Academies meeting that looked not only at the problem, but also tried to outline some steps towards solutions. Next slide, please. All right, and then September 11th occurred and everything changed. And this picture is a NIOSH picture. I believe it was from Bruce Bernard, but there were other uh, occupational physicians and industrial hygienists on that site who could have sent in this picture. It was one of them. Next slide, please. And the NIOSH industrial hygienist and the medical officers were in there within 24 hours. They were trying to provide respiratory protection on the site. They were conducting health hazard evaluations. Uh, the, the NIOSH managed to get a sole contract out the door to provide some backup medical support very early on. Lots of work on exposure assessment. Building ventilation assessment, the Secretary of Health and Human Services called NIOSH uh, industrial hygienists and engineers into DC to assess building uh, hardness for uh, respiratory contamination. Uh, the the uh, uh, boots that the firefighters were wearing on the rubble pile had not been created or developed for walking on uh, uh, this continued hot surface for the fires that continued to burn for months. So there were a number of act after action reports that developed new information and new protocols, including protocols for uh, the emergency deployment of NIOSH personnel to try to maintain their safety and health throughout these important actions. And next slide, please. All of this research and emphasis really led to NIOSH being recognized as a leader in this area, uh, the Home for the World Trade Center Health Program that not only provide surveillance and many research activities, but also provide support and medical treatment opportunities for the people who were either the responders or the survivors of September 11th. Rosie, thank you very much for that rich discussion of NIOSH, NIOSH's accomplishments. And thank you to all of our speakers for this thoughtful look back at NIOSH. What a treasure trove of history and insight you are. Now we'd like to bring all of our speakers together to discuss some pre-selected questions about NIOSH over the years. So as we bring our panelists back, we um, have some pre-selected questions that we'd like to um, have you address. And our first question is for all four of our panelists. And it is, who or what were the greatest influencers in the type of science conducted at NIOSH? Frank, would you like to start the discussion? Um, okay, yeah, sure. I think, you know, it, it's funny, it's it's an ev evolving thing. We started out as, uh, I think I'll throw back over to Dr. Hardin, uh, but there was a need to develop complete standards to go along with the TLVs that had been adopted by the Act. And I think that set NIOSH off on its first round of pulling together the information that was needed uh, to uh, develop uh, recommended exposure limits, as well as uh, the rest of the surrounding parts of, of a complete standard that would include engineering controls and so forth. And I think as Don Ellisberg mentioned, feasibility was built in and cooked into the, uh, into the Occupational Safety and Health Act. And so there was a real need to go out and determine uh, we, what was feasible, technologically feasible to be accomplished by industry so that you could at least find a floor for what OSHA might be able to do in later rulemaking. So I think those things were uh, influencers of things getting started. After that, I think people started looking at things like the HHE program and the kinds of uh, exposures that were being found for where we were. it was being identified for us by a employers requesting an HHE or B employees or their unions requesting an HHE. And it fell into two categories. One, the category of we're being exposed to something new and we don't know if it's doing something bad to us or B, 
something bad is happening here and there doesn't seem to be any exposure that explains it. Can you come in and figure? And so I think, you know, the, the, those kinds of things were both the, the act was a driver and things being brought to us by outsiders was also a driver, our stakeholders. Thank you, Frank. Don, can you give us your insights into this question about the greatest influencers? It was a combination to me when we went to NIOSH for all these things of, of sort of traditional scientists and then a lot of people who uh, seem to, uh, uh, I, I wasn't ever sure who, who they were, because, but they were really, really uh, uh, smart people. Half of them looked like they were hippies but they did good work. Uh, it was uh, it, it was not a, uh, a place where everybody was buttoned down. And the combination of, uh, I think there may be, uh, uh, th th there may be questions about the competitiveness between uh, uh, Morgantown and uh, Cincinnati, but there were a lot of people involved in this whole thing. And uh, our experience was that the, uh, the people who were running the, the uh, NIOSH at the time starting out, uh, I didn't know Dr. Key very well, but the, uh, I did know uh, uh, Jack Finkley and uh, Tony Robbins, and they, they were very uh, astute, smart, doctors, smart scientists, and uh, I think they, they contributed to making sure that there was a uh, tremendously high level of professionalism uh, wandering around those buildings. Thank you. Uh, Brian, uh, did you come on to any hippies while you were <laughs> Oh, Oh, yes. Uh, absolutely, yes. That was, uh, when I came in, it was the waning days of the Vietnam War. So we had a lot of public health service officers doing their draft time uh, at NIOSH. Uh, <clears throat> and who do you think some of the greatest influencers have been in NIOSH Well, I, I think we, we, have, we can't pass without acknowledging Senator Byrd of West Virginia. He gave us the health, the, you know, health, health laboratory division in Morgantown and that new building a, a huge boost to the bu budget with the FTEs to go with it. So he made a profound influence on what NIOSH is able to do now. Uh, things have changed so much in the years. I was remembering earlier uh, when we did criteria documents, we, one of the things we recommended was the analytical method for an an analyzing samples. The methods were all, all wet chemistry methods. Uh, we weren't allowed to recommend gas chromatography because there were too few of them in the nation to, to recommend GC techniques. Well, certainly not mass spec, my goodness, no. So it's a, it was a totally different world when NIOSH started and now uh, it's fantastic, it's, it's wonderful. Thank you. Rosie, additional thoughts about the greatest influencers? Well, so I'm going to go back to something that Frank uh, mentioned about, you know, developing for, you know, kind of developing and, and Brian for developing methods for OSHA um, that uh, even as recently as when the silica standard in this this millennium, basically, um, the epidemiology was very clear that the hazard from silica was uh, sufficient to justify a lower um, uh, uh, permissible exposure level, but the technology hadn't been developed adequately to make that really feasible. And so NIOSH really did uh, allow for that to, ha made that happen and allowed for the REL essentially to become the PEL. So that was a major thing. I did also want to mention that uh, I was grateful to Frank for his picture. He was an early adopter of the COVID beard, apparently back in 1972. Thank you. <laughs> Correct. Thank you. Uh, uh, I want, our, can can you I throw in another comment too, Sarah? Of course. There was, there was a, some interesting foundational work that was done um, actually in the 1970s and then all through the 80s on a project that was to try to figure out what things 
really needed to be worked on. And it was by counting the number of people potentially exposed to a variety of different compounds. The first one was a round of the thing, I think it was called the NOES. And then there was a NOES2 project that was done. And then there was one that was done that was called the NOES Mining Project, which went out and surveyed over 600 mines around the US. And what they did was looked and see what they inventory what chemicals were present, what mixtures of chemicals were present, and the number of workers that might have been potentially exposed to those things. Now that, that's very useful later on, and it's been used, for, it was used for 20 years. I mean, the, the, the data are really getting old at this point in time and really probably can't be used. But, uh, you know, they, they can be used in, in ter- by OSHA when they do their economic analysis, and certainly they can be used by um, NIOSH and other researchers on why it's important that if there's, when there's large numbers of workers potentially exposed. Uh, we have about 10 minutes left for um, our second question, which is uh, for Frank Hurl and Don Ellisberg. And that question is, uh, can you discuss the role of NIOSH's partners in advancing science? Hmm. Frank, would you like to take a start with that? Yeah, certainly, certainly. I have two, two thoughts that I want to put out to start the, that discussion. <clears throat> in the first place, um, in the um, uh, 1990s, um, uh, Dr. Hardin mentioned the fact that NORA was initiated. NORA is a massive partnership uh, program that we, where we went out and we recruited stakeholders to be on each of 21 different NORA teams to work together to try to develop a national agenda. And that was done in partnership. And the NORA program has been through, went through its second decade where it was focused on uh, uh, industrial sectors. And now in the third decade, focused again, focusing on industrial sectors. Um, bringing in all those partners really helps make the work that we do choose to do uh, the most relevant and the most needed. So I think that's a very important partnership uh, that, that NIOSH carries out. There are a variety of other partnerships that we got involved with. I mentioned the one which Don was involved in with us uh, with the uh, Asphalt Pavers Partnership, where we were able to solve a problem by working with uh, partners in uh, state government, federal government, labor industry, manufacturers of equipment, and be able to pull together things that by ourselves we couldn't have done. And I think that's really the, the, the key benefit of, of the partnerships and, and, and I go online, I have one more, which is that, you know, we did a lot, we do a lot of work and we find, um, identify hazards and we identify some solutions. But, you know, if you look at the case that I gave you for the coal mining and for silica, it takes decades to actually get these things so that it's into the regulatory world. But we can actually had success as Brian did uh, with the glycol ethers of, um, of actually making a, um, uh, having industry or others adopt the changes without us forcing it. And that's really happens by working through partnerships to move the research into, into action. Thank you, Frank. Uh, Don, do you have some additional insights about the role uh, of partners? Yeah. Um, <laughs> the role of partners, uh, it's kind of always been there, but uh, it has to really be formalized in a big way. The, the work that we did with the asphalt industry was uh, a combination of everybody who could stand or walk, I guess, that had anything to do with asphalt, uh, agreed to come on and be a participant. And one of the fascinating things about all the issues that came out of that study was uh, one day the uh, health and safety guy, uh, 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 Emmett Russell, for the operating engineers who was part of this group, said, you know, why don't we go and talk to the uh, people over at the, at the uh, Bureau of Mines or whatever they called it then. And uh, so we got to, had a meeting in Pittsburgh with, you know, everybody around the table. And these guys explained uh, that, well, what we really needed was to take the uh, continuous miners that they had these machines that are 15 feet tall and so forth and uh, operate uh, kind of vertically and turn them around and make them horizontal. 
and concept was the same and the ability to handle the the uh, uh, work done then uh, was a uh, a massive uh, uh, like a you know a bullet that was that was the right thing to do and that led to a lot of other things and and uh, similarly we wanted to do a study of uh, of all of these machines that work and uh, it was simple to uh, get the uh, state highway departments in uh, like in uh, Wisconsin uh, to give us eight miles of highway to play with. <laughs> you know, and, and those are things that, that you can't normally just go and say, I need you know, eight, eight miles uh, for a couple of weeks. So uh, I'm, I'm all for all the, any, any uh, partnership we can get. Great, thank you very much. And in our final few minutes, Rosie or Brian, any final comment? Rosie? I would, oh, I would, Brian, go ahead. I was just going to say that that uh, Nora has been mentioned several times uh, when in that when NIOSH was dodging that bullet, uh, we had no idea. We couldn't comprehend why we could have the enemies we had who wanted to eliminate NIOSH from the face of the earth. It was incomprehensible. Why didn't they like us? And uh, Linda Rosenstock called in the, or called contact at the Organization for Resource Counselors, ORC, and asked them to bring their constituents in and have a sit down meeting with us one day and explain what's going on and how can we, how can we be more likable? Uh, they gave us an earful. Boy, did they give us an earful. And, and it was after that that we fell back and said, okay, maybe we're not as wonderful as we think we are. We'd better get, we'd better get to coordinating with the people on the outside that, that we think we're serving and make sure we really are. And, and that was the base, the, the origin of Nora. Thank you. Rosie, last word? Last word is I think that we are in a new era now. I think because of all that the country has been through with the pandemic and, and uh, increasing inequality and that with the new administration, there is a sense that unions are back potentially and that worker safety and health matters. And I'm optimistic. I think it's a wonderful time to be doing this kind of work. Thank you very much. And I want to express our heartfelt thank you to our distinguished panel for your help in kicking off the 50th anniversary celebration of the National Institute for Occupational Safety and Health. There will be a number of activities celebrating NIOSH's 50th anniversary throughout 2021, and we invite you to join us. Please visit our anniversary webpage. This concludes our webinar today. We want to thank you for joining us. Stay safe and well. Stay Stay safe and well, and happy birthday, Nyash. <laughs> yeah.